It is good to be back. Uh, Lisa and I traveled to Turkey and we traveled to Greece. We traveled uh, into every area that uh, John and Paul traveled to or wrote an epistle to. And it was really wonderful. But as she said, we were so glad to get back to America. And it always amazes me that so many of our politicians and so many of our citizens here in the United States want to try and copy what's going on in Europe. And my first thought is, have you ever gone over there? It's unbelievable. We do not want to copy what they're doing, people. We want to stay on the track of what's made America great. So I just want to throw that out before I teach tonight. Anyways, the last time I taught on a Wednesday night, we were in the 17th chapter in the book of Genesis. And of course, my focus was on the purpose of circumcision. I might have embarrassed some of you, but you know, the Bible talks about circumcision. So I spent that entire Wednesday night focusing on the purpose of circumcision. I wanted to explain why God chose circumcision to be the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. And the reason I wanted to do that is because in my experience, I have found that the majority of Christians don't know what the purpose of circumcision was. They have no idea why God chose circumcision to be the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. So I thought it was necessary to focus on that. And hopefully, for those of you who didn't know what the purpose of circumcision was, that was an enlightening experience. But there is a problem that arises whenever I do that, and I focus on one particular thing in a passage of Scripture. And that is that we tend to neglect all of the, impo all of the other important details in that chapter. And that's what happened. As we focused in on, on the purpose of circumcision, we neglected all of the other important details that's found in, in chapter 17 of the book of Genesis. So what we're going to do tonight is go through chapter 17 again. And this time we're going to concentrate on the story itself. So turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis chapter 17. And as you're turning there, let me give you some background information that you need to know. First of all, 13 years had passed from the end of chapter 16 to the beginning of chapter 17. So most of us don't catch that. As we're reading along, and this story is kind of going on in chronological order, we tend to think that all of these ha things are happening just bam, 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 bam. But I want you to understand that 13 years passes between the end of chapter 16 to the beginning of chapter 17. Verse 16 happens to be the last verse in chapter 16. So what I want to do is I want to read Genesis chapter 16, verse 16, and chapter 17, verse number 1, together. Follow along with me if you would. And Abram was fourscore and six years old. How old is that? So they're in parentheses for you. 86, when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abram. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine... Big gap there, people. The Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. So Abram was 86 years old when Ishmael was born, and he was 99 when God appeared to him again. Subtract 86 from 99 and you get 13. So a period of 13 years had passed from the events that occurred in chapter 16 to what's going to occur in chapter 17. And that's what you need to keep in mind. Secondly, Abram had given up all hope of ever having a child with Sarai, and let me explain why. First of all, Abram was 99 years old. Secondly, Sarai had reached menopause years ago, so it was no longer possible for her to have children. Now, Pastor, how could you know that? Well, I know that because the Bible tells us that. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis 17:17. 17, 17. We're going to skip on up to the front. Notice what it says. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is 90 years, 90 years old bear children? Now why in the world would he say a hundred when it says he was 99? Because he understands that there's going to be a nine month period and by that time he'll be a hundred. So he says, can a man who's a hundred years old and a woman who's 90 years old have a child? Not only that, look at Genesis chapter 18 verse number 11. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old. Lisa gets on to me all the time because I'll look at these young people doing certain things and I have knee problems and a lower back problem and I feel old at times. And I'll say, I'm just an old man. And she'll say, you're not old. You quit saying that. Well, you know, Abraham couldn't argue with God and the Bible says that Abraham and Sarah were old and well-stricken 
in age. Now, how many of you know that it's not a good thing to be stricken? They were well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Now, what does the word manner mean? It means the way. And what's the way of a woman? Well, what this is telling us is that Sarah had stopped having periods because she had reached the age of menopause. Because the way it works with women is that when they reach puberty, they begin having periods. And they'll have periods up until the age of maybe 45 to 55, somewhere in there. And then that ceases to be with them after the manner of women or the way it is for women. So what this is telling us is that she had reached the age of menopause. In fact, she had reached the age of menopause years ago, many years ago. So you need to keep those two things in mind as we study this story in chapter 17. So turn to verses 1 and 2 and let's begin. It says, And when Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, I want you to notice that God reveals himself to Abram by a new name. El Shaddai. El Shaddai means God Almighty. But more importantly, it emphasizes God's omnipotence. Now, does everyone know what the word omnipotent means? Omnipotent means all-powerful or able to do anything. So God is revealing himself to Abraham as the God that can do anything. So whenever you're reading through the Old Testament and you come to this phrase where it says, the Lord God Almighty, it would do you well to look at the original Hebrew, to go out and find out what that word is behind that phrase. And most likely it will be El Shaddai. And that means God Almighty, but more importantly, it's emphasizing God's omnipotence. That God can do anything. Nothing is too difficult for Him. In fact, when it comes to the story, God specifically waited until it was physically impossible for Abram and Sarai to have a child together in order to fill God's covenant promise with Abraham. Now that's really interesting. Here God makes a promise... But he waits to fulfill that promise until it's physically impossible for that to happen. But the reason he waited is because he wanted Abram and Sarai to know that when she got pregnant, it was God who made it happen. There was no other way that this could happen except God intervened. Who else but God could promise that a 90-year-old woman who'd been barren all of her life and who had reached menopause years ago, would become pregnant, and then this God can make it happen. Only an omnipotent God can do something like that. But of course, we're getting ahead of the story. At this point in verses 1 and 2, God is simply revealing himself, as, or revealing himself to Abram as being omnipotent. I am God Almighty. I am El Shaddai. Now look at verses 3, 4, and 5. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be the father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, the first thing that God did after claiming to be omnipotent was to change Abram's name. Now, if you're like me and you've grown up in church and you grew up reading the New Testament and every time it mentions Abram, what does it call him? Abraham. And so I've had the tendency as we were going through the book of Genesis to refer to Abram as Abraham before his time. And I shouldn't have done that because he is not known as Abraham until this point in history. At this point... The first thing that God does after claiming to be omnipotent was to change Abram's name. Now, what most people don't know is that Abram's name had to have been an embarrassment for him. How many of you would have ever guessed that? That Abram's name was an embarrassment to him. Now, let me explain why I say that. According to Boyce, Abram means father of many. Father of many. 
Now, there are some that disputes that, but after doing my study, I agree with Boyce. It means father of many. And Genesis chapter 13, verse number 2, tells us that Abram was a very wealthy man. And if you go back to verse number 2 in the 13th chapter, you'll find out that he owned lots of livestock. In fact, he owned so much livestock, and Lot owned so much livestock, that the, the land could not sustain the both of them. So they had to go their separate ways. That's how much livestock that Abram owned. Now, in order for the land to sustain that, there has to be enough water. So, whenever a caravan of merchants passed through the land, they had to water their animals from Abram's watering hose and wells because Abram owned almost all of the watering hose in that area, in that mountainous area. So they had to use his watering hose to water their animals and to fill their water bags, or what we would call canteens. And Abram's servants would sell them food or whatever products they needed. So it was really a good situation for both of them. Abram could make a little money on the side, but also the caravan could water their animals, they could get the food they needed, and they could continue on. And they would be in complete safety of Abram. So at the end of the day, it was customary for the merchants of that caravan to go to Abram's tent to pay their respects. That's what you did. If there was a friendly person or a friendly town or a friendly city and they allowed you to come in and do trade with them and to water your livestock and to continue on safely, then what you were supposed to do was to go pay your respects to the elders. So, it was, very, it was customary for the merchants to go to Abram's tent to pay their respects. And the introductions always followed a set pattern. The members of the caravan would introduce themselves, and then Abram would introduce himself. And because names normally describe something about that person, questions would arise from the introduction of names. That was considered polite conversation. So when Abram introduced himself, it always raised the very same question. You're Abram, the father of many, so how many children do you have? And it must have been very embarrassing for Abram to say, I don't have any children. And you know how people are, especially in that culture, because we looked at this when we were talking about Hagar and the concubine. You wanted to have as many children as possible, especially sons. So in that culture, if your wife wasn't producing enough children, the pagans would do what? They would take a second wife or a third wife or concubines. And here Abram is, and they come to him, and he says, My name is Abram, the father of many. And that naturally brings up the question, Oh, so how many children do you have? And he has to say, None. Now what are they going to think? That he's monogamous? No. They're going to think he's sterile. Because not only can his wife not have children, I'm sure he's got concubines and others, so he's not having any children. And it would have been very embarrassing for him. Now, when they heard this name and they found out he didn't have any kids, this was funny. And it would have been very hard to keep a straight face, but for the sake of being polite, they had to. So, you know, Abram must have hated the fact that his name always brought up the topic of children and drew attention to the fact that he didn't have any. In fact, if it happened once, it probably happened a thousand times. After the introduction, the other person would say, Abram, that means the father of many. Congratulations, how many children do you have? Oh, I see. Sorry. And you got to know that when they left Abram's tent, when they were out of ear hearing or where he could hear them, they started making fun of him. Yeah, they wouldn't do it in front of him, but they would do it behind his back, which all of his servants would have heard, or a few of them, and you know, that would go through the camp, and they would have seen how embarrassed Abram was every time someone asked, and he had to tell them that he didn't have any children. So you know the servants talked about it, and they even wondered about it, who was sterile, because they knew that Abram was monogamous. Who was sterile, Abram or Sarai? So when Abram had Ishmael, it had to be a great relief. Because now he could say, when people asked, how many children do you have? He could say, I have a son. Oh yeah, I'm a dad, I've got a boy. It's not me, it's Sarai. Now, women, you probably don't get that. But every man knows, oh yeah, being 
all man, you know, you can't wait till your wife gets pregnant. The big thing, the, the reason you're so proud, it's not for the same reason that women are. Women are just proud to be pregnant, you know, and all of this. They're going to have children. And men are just proud that they're going to have children because it proves they're having sex. That's a joke. No one laughed. Okay. <laughs> men didn't laugh because it's true. But anyways, uh, you know, you know we, we, I'm having a boy. You know, you just want to know, yeah, I'm a man. And it's kind of that way. And, you know, there's those, those gossip that comes and those jokes that are being made about Abram. You know, here he is. He's getting to be an old man. Sarai's beginning to be an old man. You know, they're monogamous. They're believing in God. But there's no children. So when Hagar comes along and Sarai throws her as a concubine to her or, or to Abram. And Abram has Ishmael by it. All of a sudden it's a relief. But... Now that he could finally stop being embarrassed by his name, guess what God does? God ups and changes it. He wants to change it from Abram to Abraham. Now, what does Abraham mean? Does anyone know? It means the father of multitudes. Now, it's bad enough to be the father of many and only having one son. But now you up the ante. You are now going to be called the father of multitudes. I want you to think about this. When God changed Abram's name, he expected Abram to use that new name. Out with the old, in with the new. So when Abram told everyone his new name, and he started referring to himself as Abraham and introducing himself as Abraham, they must have thought he was crazy. He had one child at 86 with the concubine, and now at 99, he thinks he's going to have more children? Yeah. Right. There ain't no way Sarai's going to let him sleep with another concubine. We know how that story ended last time, right? She's not about to let another woman go sleep with him. And Sarai's 90, which means she's reached the age of menopause years ago. So she's not going to be having any more kids. So Abraham's got to be crazy. He comes back and says, I've had this encounter with God. I don't want anyone to call me Abram anymore, father of many. I want you to call me Abraham because God said, father of multitudes. Wow. I want you to see this through the servant's eyes. The old man wants to be called Abraham. And to top it off, he thinks God told him to change his name. Well, let's humor him. What else can we do? He is the master. So now we re will refer to him as Abraham. But then Abraham goes further. And he tells his servants what else God commanded him to do. Now wait a minute. You want to do what with a knife? Hey, you want to be called Abraham? That's all right. We'll call you Abraham. But please don't do that. Don't circumcise us. Let's read verses 6 through 14. And, and, you know, it doesn't say this, but sometimes we need to put ourselves in the place of everyone else. Because here Abraham is he's receiving this revelation from God, and now he's giving us this revelation. But I want you to put yourself in the place of Ishmael and all of his other servants. Because God's not just requiring Abraham to be circumcised. He's requiring every male in his household to be circumcised. Let's read verses 6 through 14. And I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Now I want you to understand, he's explaining why he's calling him the father of multitudes. Now you need to understand something about the Old Testament. You will never find the word grandfather in Hebrew. Now it will say it in our King James Version and some of the other translations, but the truth of the matter is you'll never see the word grandfather in Hebrew, in the original Hebrew. Why? They only use the word father. And the word father can refer to the real father or it can refer to a grandfather or a great-grandfather. Does that make sense? So when he calls him the father of multitudes, he doesn't just mean that he's going to be the father of multitudes as the physical father. He's also meaning he's going to be the grandfather or he's going to be the great-great-grandfather. He's basically going to be the patriarch, and he's explaining this here. All right? So I want to make sure that as we read this, you understand why God is changing his name to the father of multitudes. He's only going to have one son through Sarai. 
and that's Isaac. But through Isaac, he's going to be the father, the patriarch, the grandfather, the great-grandfather, the great-great-great-grandfather. There's going to be a whole lineage that's going to come through Isaac. So notice what it says. I will make thee exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to, the, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan, now notice this, for an everlasting possession. All of the land of Canaan Actually, that would mean all of Israel, a portion of Lebanon, Transjordan, Sinai Peninsula, for an everlasting covenant or possession. And I will be their God. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Now notice this. He's referring to generations on down the line. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and thy seed, the generations after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token, a sign of the covenant between you and me and you. And, the, and he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Why? until he's eight. Well, some people will tell you because medically that's the best time to do it, and that might be one of the reasons. But if you look in the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus, no animal was able to be sacrificed unto God until it was at least eight days old. And the reason it had to be at least eight days old is because it had to go through those seven days picturing creation. It had to come to that, okay, now it's to the point where we've gone through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We are coming to that time where it's pure and complete cycle of creation, and at that point it can. So on the eighth day, they shall be circumcised among you. Every male child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of the foreskin is not circumcised, that so should be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now, I'm not going to go into circumcision because we spent the entire service last time just focusing on circumcision. And if you weren't here then, then go back and, and watch the DVD. But I'm not going to go into that. But here's what I want to pull out. Maybe it's just me. But when I look at this from a servant's point of view, it's kind of funny. Hey, wait a minute, Abraham. This is between you and God. What's this have to do with me? Anyways, I just thought it was kind of funny. But enough about circumcision. Let's get back to Abraham's name because this is very important. When God changed Abram's name, all he did was add an H to it. Did you know that? And if you want to get technical... He simply added what linguists call a rough breathing. Now, does everyone know what I mean by a rough breathing? How many of you have ever taken a foreign language and you know what a rough breathing is? Okay. How many of you have no idea what a rough breathing is? Okay. Pay close attention. It's not hard, but I'm going to explain it through a few things. In fact, I'm going to use the Greek language as an example. In Greek, Koinea Greek, the common Greek of Jesus' day, you have smooth breathing marks, and you have rough breathing marks. And I'm going to use the word heteros as an example. Let me just go ahead and write that word up here. I'm going to write it big so everyone can see it. This is the Greek word heteros. All right? Heteros means another of a different kind. You have two words for another. You have heteros and alos. Now, Alos means another of the same kind. Heteros means another of a different kind. Let me explain the difference. Uh, Lisa and I are both human beings. But she's another human being of a different kind because I'm a male and she's a female. If Randall Miller was in here, he would be another of the same kind. We are both human beings, but we're both males. 
So when you use the word alos, you mean it's another of the same kind. When you use the word heteros, it is another of a different kind. Now, this word starts off with an epsilon. Epsilon is the equivalent of our letter E. We pronounce it E, like met, get, any of those E sounds like that. So why don't we pronounce this eteros? Some of you think, well, you were pronouncing it eteros. No, no, no. I was pronouncing it with the H sound, heteros. Why was I doing that? Well, because when you're reading along in Greek, there is a rough breathing mark over the first letter. That rough breathing mark tells you that you need to pronounce it with an H sound. And the way that you make an H sound is by exhaling. When you say hot, when you make that H sound, you exhale. Hot. If there's a lot of heat, if you need help, the way that you make an, an H sound is you have that rough breathing. And that's what it, why it's called a rough breathing. Now, this would have a smooth breathing. How do you know it's a smooth breathing? Think of this as a sail. We're going this way and the wind is blowing into it, so you've got easy sailing. So that is an easy breathing. Does that make sense? Smooth sailing, smooth breathing. This is a going against it. So it's a rough breathing. But whenever you have a rough breathing, it simply means that you're going to give the H sound. You are going to breathe. You are going to exhale. How many of you ever gone to the doctor and he tells you, as he puts the little thing there and says, take a deep breath, hold it, now exhale. What do you do? You hear that H? So whenever I see a rough breathing mark, I exhale as I pronounce that word. If it had a smooth breathing mark, I would pronounce it in a regular way. I wouldn't say heteros, I would say eteros. Now, when God changed Abram's name, all he did was add a rough breathing to it. Instead of Abram, it was Abraham. Did anyone catch what I did? Instead of Abram, it became Abraham. Do you catch that? He's putting a rough breathing in front of the, if you wanted to be Greek, it would be mu, but if we want in English, it would be m. It's Abraham. There's a rough breathing. So you're just adding a burst of breath to pronounce it. Now, pastor, why is that important? It's very important, and let me tell you why. Because in Hebrew and in Greek, breath and spirit are the very same word. How many of you know what the Greek word for spirit is? Pneuma, right? Does everyone know that? Did you know that the Greek word for spirit, we're kind of going off on a tangent here, but this is good for you. It is the Greek word pneuma. We would probably spell it in English like that. Anyone ever seen that, pneuma? That is the Greek word for spirit. Now, Here's what's interesting. We have English words that come from the Greek word. How many of you have any pneumatic tools? What does that mean? It means air powered. Air, breath. So I want you to understand that in Greek and Hebrew, breath and spirit are the very same word. So in Hebrew and Greek, breath is always associated with God's spirit. Let me give you an example. In Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7. It says that God breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Everyone remember that scripture? God breathed into, the, into, breathed into man the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Now, what we're supposed to get out of that verse is that God breathed into man the spirit of life, and he became a living soul. You see the word breath in Hebrew. Neshama can be translated as either breath or spirit. And in this context, the meaning is the same. Because when your breath is gone, your what is gone? Your spirit is gone. You're dead. When you stop breathing and your breath is gone, the spirit is gone. You are dead. The spirit of life is gone. People, they're the same thing. So what God did in Genesis chapter 2, verse number 7, is he breathed into Adam. 
he blew into his lungs the spirit of life and he became a living soul. And we translate that Hebrew word, neshama. We translate it as breath, but it can easily be translated as spirit. And many translations will do that. God breathed into man the spirit of life, and he became a living soul. And someone goes, well, that's not right. The King James Version says, no, no, no. You need to understand something. Neshama can be translated either way, breath or spirit. When God breathed into man, he became a living spirit. Or he bring the man the spirit of life and he became a living soul. Let me say it that way. Now, let me give you a New Testament example. Turn to John chapter 20, verse 22. It says, then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Who is he? Jesus Christ. This is John chapter 20, so it's after the resurrection. He's met with his disciples. They now know that he's resurrected. They believe in the resurrection. So they believe that Jesus died for their sins, that God raised him from the dead. He's now their Lord, so they're saved. But notice what Jesus does. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. People, Jesus' breath is associated with the Holy Spirit. When he breathed on them, that's when they received the Holy Spirit. So his breath, a rough breathing, an exhale, blowing, is what and how they received the Holy Spirit. Now, let me explain why this is so important when it comes to Abraham's name. To change Abram to Abraham, all you do is add your breath to it. Abram becomes (laughs) Abraham. Did you catch that? Abram becomes Abraham. So when God called Abram Abraham, What he was really doing was adding his breath or spirit to Abram's name. In other words, he was empowering Abram with the Holy Spirit. It's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord. And that's what he was telling Abram when he changed his name. He was telling him, I am El Shaddai. I am the omnipotent God. Nothing is impossible for me. I can do anything that I want to do. And I'm going to empower you with my spirit. Therefore, you will no longer be called Abram, but you will be called Abraham. Because my spirit is going to empower you. I'm going to breathe on you. Wow. Now. Now we're going to see the miraculous work of God. But it's going to be by the spirit of God. And that's how simple it was to change his name. He went from being Abram to being Abram. God empowered him with the Spirit. And now we begin to see all these miraculous things begin to take place. Up until this time, God blessed Abraham. But he did it physically and he did it naturally. Now, God is going to do it supernaturally. And that's what he's telling Abram. He's telling him, that's not going to be the seed in which I'm going to be blessed. I've waited until it's physically impossible. You're going to be 100 years old. She's going to be 90 years old. She reached the age of menopause many, 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 many years ago. Her womb was dead before she reached that age. Never had a child. Now it's completely dead and no one will ever argue with that. So I'm going to do a supernatural work. About this time next year. You're going to have a child. And everyone's going to know that I am El Shaddai. And you, Abram, I have breathed on. And you have become Abraham. That's good. Now, let's look at what God promised to Abraham and how Abraham responded in verses 15 through 18. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, notice he's not calling him Abram anymore. Anyone see that? And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. Now here's what's interesting. Most people will tell you there is no difference in the meaning between Sarai and Sarah. Did you know that? It means princess. Sarai means princess. Sarah means princess. So why did God change the name? Because it's the way you pronounce it. 
Sarai went into Sarah. God's breathing on Sarah. I'm going to do a supernatural work in Sarah's life. Let's go further. And I will bless her. And I will give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed. Now, he understood what God was saying. I'm going to do supernatural work. I'm going to breathe on you, and I'm going to breathe on her. I'm going to make you alive. You might be stricken with age, arthritis, all these things. I'm going to breathe on you. And I have a feeling when Abraham got up, it was like, oh, my gosh. There's no arthritis. Look what God has done. I, feel, I, I really feel like Sarah. I was like, ooh, something's different. But anyways, and Abraham, Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Now most of us misinterpret this. In fact, a lot of the translations do. But they shouldn't. God specifically told Abraham in verse 16 that Sarai would give him a son. Now, I want you to notice how he responds. Look at verse 17. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is hundred years old? And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? Now, people, Abraham was not laughing in disbelief. He was laughing for joy and amazement at what God had promised to do. Now, normally I tell people when they're reading the Bible through in a year, read the NLT because it's written in everyday language. But here the NLT really misses it because it says that Abraham laughed in disbelief and that's not a translation that's an interpretation they added that and they added it wrongly I want you to understand that Abraham did not laugh in disbelief he laughed for joy and amazement at what God had promised to do and let me explain how I know that let me explain how I know that he did not have any disbelief first of all if Abraham had laughed in disbelief God's response would have been entirely different if you remember when Sarai laughed in disbelief, and of course we haven't gotten to that yet, we will. What did God do? He rebuked her. You don't laugh at God and get away with it. But God did not rebuke Abraham. Why? Because when Abraham laughed, it was for joy, not disbelief. Secondly, we know that it was for joy and not disbelief because Paul told us in Romans chapter 4, verse 19, that Abraham believed God when he told him that Sarai would give him a son. Look at Romans chapter 4, verse number 19. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's room. How old was Abraham when God promised him that Sarai would give him a son? About 100 years old. 99 to be exact. So Paul is referring to the promise... In Genesis chapter 17, verse 16. So I want you to write in your Bible. Romans 4, 19 is referring to Genesis 17, 16. And he tells us, Paul tells us, that Abraham believed God and he didn't even doubt for a minute that God could do it even though he was 100 years old and he was well stricken in age and Sarai was 90 and she was past the childbearing years. That's how we know that Abraham was not laughing in disbelief. He was laughing for joy and amazement at what God had promised to do at this late stage in his life. But then it hits Abraham. What about Ishmael? What part does he play in the covenant? Is he going to be left out? So notice what Abraham says in verse 18. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. Now, remember... What God told him. He said, walk before me and be perfect. So what he's saying is, oh, that Ishmael should be a part of this covenant. Because he knew that what him and Sarai had concocted earlier with Haggai was not part of God's will. So he's looking at Ishmael and he's saying, well, what part's he going to play in the covenant? You're not going to leave him out, are you? So what he's saying is, oh God, that Ishmael might live before thee. In other words, Abraham doesn't want Ishmael to be left out. He wants him to have a part in the covenant. But people, it's not to be. Yes, God will bless him. But Ishmael has no part in the covenant that God made with Abraham. Turn to verses 18 through 21. We're still in Genesis chapter 17. Notice what it says. 
And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. In other words, be part of his covenant to walk before you and be perfect. And God said, He answered, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. Do you know what Isaac means? Laughter. <laughs> How many of you had something so good that happens to you and you want to cry and laugh at the same time? That's what Isaac means. Laughing and crying at the same time. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Now you asked about Ishmael, so let me tell you. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. I know your heart, Abraham. Behold, I have blessed Ishmael, and I will make him fruitful. And I will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But, but, my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. The covenant that God made with Abraham and his descendants doesn't apply to Ishmael and his descendants. It only applies to Isaac and Isaac's seed, Isaac's descendants. And in chapter 21, we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. God tells Abraham to listen to Sarah and to send Ishmael away. God tells him, send him away. He's not to have a part of this inheritance. He's not to have a part of the covenant that God made to Abraham. And neither does his descendants. God's going to bless them. But they're not part of the covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. So, the land of Israel. It does not belong to the Palestinians. It does not belong to the descendants of Ishmael. It belongs to the Jews. The descendants of Isaacs. No ifs, and, and buts. Now... That might sound cruel, but it's not, and we'll see why when we get to chapter 21, but that's later. Let's read uh, verses 23 through 27, and we'll end with that. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. Went up actually means he lifted up. So again, this is another theophany, or we would say Christophany, a revelation of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, because no one can see God's face and live. So who is God? Who can you see and still live? Jesus Christ who is God. So this is a Christophany. And he lifts up, goes back to heaven. That's why Jesus told Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day, as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old. That's going to become very important, because we're going to know how old he was when God said, cast him out, he wasn't a little bitty child. I'll whet your appetite. We'll talk about how old he was then. When he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And the selfsame day Abraham was circumcised in Ishmael his son. And all the men of his house, born in the house and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. So Abraham obeyed God and circumcised everyone in his household. And he walked before God and was perfect. Now... The only reason he was perfect is because of his faith, the faith in the seed that was coming. Because he continues to screw up. But the difference is, he has faith in what God said. And it's our faith that makes us righteous.